Hello, hello. How's everybody? Right. Thanks so much for being here on Labor Day weekend. It makes me feel better about myself that you all aren't traveling either, so thank you. Um, take that off. And thank you so much for wearing masks. Uh, I really appreciate how this community has just rallied around to love the people here in front of us, to make sure that we can meet together in person, and masks make that happen. So I just really appreciate how you guys have been so accommodating that way. It makes my heart really proud of us. Um, so my name is Susanna. I'm the campus pastor here. If I haven't had a chance to officially meet you, I would really love the opportunity to say hi after we get um, after we leave tonight. I will be out at tonight. Did you hear that? It's morning. <laughs> Woo! Um, old habits die hard. We get to meet in the morning now. Um, I will be out at the at the connecting point, which is the welcome desk that you saw when you came in after service is over. So I'd love the opportunity to say hi to you. Um, around here at North Star, our mission is simple: go, love, live. Go to the missing, love the marginalized, and live as God's kids. That is what has driven us to be here in Westchester. We are going to the missing in Westchester, right? We are loving the marginalized, and we are here to live as God's kids. So I'm so excited that we get the opportunity to do that together. I have just a couple announcements for you. Um, we mentioned last week that the School of Kingdom Ministry is still happening this fall. Uh, they're working out the balance between in-person and digital meeting, but they are going to host that. If you are interested in learning more about how to, to live as God's kids, right, um, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and act on it, do the things that we see um, God doing, I'd encourage you to check that out on our website, School of Kingdom Ministry. Also, uh, we are going to join together. We're going to start reading the Gospels in our reading plan. We've been reading through the Bible together, and the Gospels are going to start October the 9th. And so we're encouraging people to get together in organic, smaller groups and meet once a week to discuss what we're learning and what we're seeing and how God is speaking to us through the Gospels. We're calling that Gospel 43 because it takes 43 weeks, is that right, to read the Gospels together. So there is a link on, um, there's a link on our website and you guys can check that out. Uh, let's see, I may have gotten that wrong. Beginning on October the 9th, two to five people, 43 days, not 43 weeks, sorry. I knew that was wrong when I said it out loud, so I'm just going to correct myself. 43 days, that's a long time to read through the Gospels. Um, anyway, so, uh, and last, um, we are no longer collecting offering with the passing of the bags for obvious reasons, but we do have uh, the offering box on the back wall, and you're welcome to drop your tithes and offerings back there, or we have opportunities online to give. Um, online, you can set that up. But uh, in the meantime, would you please, uh, oh, and remember that a minimum of 25%, usually it's closer to 40, honestly, everything that comes in goes back out into local and global missions. So when you're giving here, we are giving back to our community, which again is part of our mission to love those in our community. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to gather together in person again. It's encouraging to see faces, to remember what your community is about. May we be um, a light in Westchester. May we live as God's kids, loving those people who are near us into relationship with you. God, we give you this time. We give you our resources. We ask that you would meet us here. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
nothing better than you, that when we don't see the way, that you make a way for us, and that you love us and you guide us every single step of the way. So Jesus, be with us this morning. Teach us more about who you are as we learn who, you're, who you are and who your character is and what you want for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, just wave to your neighbors and say hi, and then go ahead and take a seat. have the opening video. All right. Wrong video. There's an opening video of the... All right. Great to see you guys here today. I'm Matt. I'm one of the teaching pastors, one of the elders here at uh, North Star and here at Westchester. Great to see you guys here today on this Labor Day weekend. Great to have you guys. So if you're a parent, uh, if your kids are grown, your kids are whatever age or stage they are, if you've been a parent at some time in your life, you have felt what I'm about to talk about in this just next moment. If you've never been a parent and you've been a sibling, you're going to know what I'm going to talk about, but, but from a different angle, right? And here's the feeling I'm going to talk about. Have you ever had that moment where you're watching your children and they're engaging in such a connected, beautiful way? They're talking and they're coloring and they're laughing and they're hugging and watching something together or playing together. And as a parent... You know that feeling. You just kind of pull back and say, I don't even want to interrupt the moment. You know what I'm talking about? You don't want to interrupt the moment. You're like, oh my goodness, we are such amazing parents, right? You just think this like, oh, I'm amazing. My wife is amazing. Look how great our children are. They're connected. They're unified. They're loving each other. And if you're a sibling, even in that situation, you don't even know the joy of what's occurring. You just know it's great. And then something happens. And all heck breaks loose, right? You ever know? And I was like, what? What happened? They're, they're, they're like cats and dogs. They're fighting. They're hitting. They're spit. Whatever. You're like, you're like what, what? What happened? And you immediately go from like, and you, you look at your wife and you, or your husband and you go, you're a horrible parent. This is why this is happening. Right? It looks, maybe it looks something like, like this. All right, you get the point. That's enough of that. <laughs> Could you imagine being in that car? But that's what watching your kids is like. And it's just it's so tiring, right? And if, if you're the parent, it's so tiring. I remember my dad, who's not a super emotional guy, when my twin brother and I would start fighting like dogs, he'd pull us together and be like, come on, guys. You're going to have each other forever. Don't crush each other like this. Be connected. You're brothers. And if you're the sibling in it, you just think, it's so tiring. It's such a bummer. And you feel that heaviness. Well, here's the deal. I think that's, there's this level of that's how, I, I, I'm not going to say I know exactly how God feels, but I think it's how God feels right now in the midst of the disunity in our culture. I think he sees all the disunity. And as, as the father, he's looking at all the disconnection, disunity, especially among his church. And, and I didn't know God... God never gets tired because God's never tired. And God doesn't get sad like we are. But I, I think it just breaks his heart to see his kids fight and be fractured over the things that, that, that when you're a parent, you're watching your kids fight over the iPad. And you're like, this doesn't matter. Or they're fighting over the TV show. And in 10 minutes, they're not even remember what they're fighting about, right? I think it just breaks his heart. I was asking the Lord about this last week. It was two Fridays ago before I was preparing for this talk to give to the Loveland campus. 
And I said, Lord, what do you, what do you feel? And I, again, I got this download from the Lord. I got this word, I believe, from the Lord. And I want to share it with you guys. And when I say I got a word from the Lord, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. I'm not saying whatever I said is you're going to canonize and put it in scripture. We believe it's the birthright of all God's kids to hear their dad's voice. And I asked the Lord, I got this, what I would call a download. And again, I'm going to share it with you. It's for me. I believe as one of the leaders of Northside, I have the authority to share it with you. I hope you receive it. If you don't want to pick it up and run with it, don't. But I'd love you to hear this. So just, here we go. I asked the Lord, and here's what he said, Matt, I'm just so tired and sad at seeing my kids rip each other apart. I'm tired of division and discord. I'm tired of writing, but I'm tired of racism. I'm tired of sad at George Floyd's murder and Ahmaud Arbery's murder, these senseless deaths by people of power. I'm tired of my children and people killing each other in the neighborhoods and the streets by their peers. I'm also tired of my kids' passivity. I'm tired of my kids turning a blind eye. I'm tired of my kids not caring anymore, becoming jaded and cynical. I'm tired of moral failure among any leaders, but especially my faith leaders. But most of all, I'm tired of my children fighting and not standing in solidarity against the things that really matter. Racism, poverty, evil, and sin. I'm sad that my kids stand more for what they're against and stand more for, what, for protecting their rights and defending their portfolios than they are for standing for saving lost people and loving the marginalized and bringing my kingdom of love and grace to a world that so desperately needs it. I'm tired of my kids not striving to make it here on earth as it is in heaven. I'm tired of my kids' indifference to sin and brokenness. I'm tired of the fact that you care more about the election, more, more about the stock market, and more about mass or no mass than we do about lost people dying and death and division and emotional dis- destruction in the world. To quote Tony Campolo, I'm sad that most of my kids don't give a stuff about all the stuff in the world. And they care more about the fact that I said stuff than the fact there's so much division and brokenness and sin in the world. I know it's heavy. But church family, I, I think we're meant to be the solution to the problems in the world. We're not meant to bring more problems. And I believe the church of Jesus Christ, the big C church of Jesus Christ, the children of Jesus, we are put on this earth to make it here on earth as, as, as in heaven. We're, we're here to bring the solution. I believe we're the answer to the brokenness and the pain in all of our brokenness, and all of our sin, we're the answer to bring, and we do that by bringing the love and grace of Jesus through unity of the body and being unified in the things that really matter. I, I, I am, again, I don't know if, how, if God gets tired or not, but I, I believe God's sad at this. The question are we, and do we want to be the solution? So that's why we're doing this series called One. And the whole point of this is to be unified in the one things that matter. And again, that doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. But we're unified and we stand as one in the things that matter. So let me pray before I jump into week uh, three of this series in the book of Philippians. Jesus, if there's anything I've said or will say that's not of you, I pray pray that you sift that out. I pray that your words would come through and your scripture would breathe and we would leave here today wanting and craving and desiring to be more united in one in the things that matter. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to, to Philippians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul speaks the importance of this unity. This book could be called the unifying book around the one things that matter. He's been challenging this church to stand in solidarity together in the things that matter. There's a lot of division in this city, in this Roman colony called Philippi. And there was reason for this group of ragtag group of people to be divided. They came from, they were different Jews and Gentiles, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different races. They came together in this church because they met Jesus. Remember Acts 16, we're introduced to this church. And there was Lydia, the, 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 the wealthy lady that sold purple cloth. You had the, the slave girl that came to Christ. You had the jailer and his whole family. You had people like this coming together of different backgrounds of faith. And, and, and the Roman colony was watching them and they wanted them to fail. 
And at the same time, there was Judaizers, these Jews that would come in and try to get them to go back to the old ways. And they were having some battling in there. He talks about it in chapter 3, about some of the don't go back to that old ways. And, and he even calls out a couple of names. He calls out Euodia and Sintich in chapter 4, verse 2. And they were fighting because their names were so weird. But the, the reality is there was division. And he was calling them to unity and the things that matters. It's like Paul's watching his kids going, be unified. Don't let the world tear you down. Don't be divided into things that don't matter. That's what the enemy wants. And he gives this firm and loving, direct challenge invitation, invitation and challenge to the church and to us for today. Here's what he says, verse one of chapter two. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy, let's stop there. Paul's grammar is really weird here. The, the, the English translates it, therefore, if, or so, if. It's kind of weird. The literal Greek translation here is stronger. It's a weird translation. It's so sense. When we say, therefore, if, you know, every time we see a therefore, you ask what's the therefore, therefore, referring back to previous stuff. But the if, kind of like, if this is happening, but this is, not, this is a so sense. He just said in verse 27, look, if you get the gospel, live a life worthy of that gospel. Don't let anything rip you apart. Live a life worthy of that gospel. Stand strong in that gospel. So sense, so sense. And he goes, so sense. These are statements of fact, statements of truth. These things are true. They, they're not in question. So sense you've received encouragement in Christ. By the way, can I just say, this is like it's written to family members. If you're, if you're here and, and you're not a believer, this actually, for you get, to get to watch, it's not spoken at you. You, you get to watch this and hear this and hold us accountable in it. You get to come to church people and go, you're supposed to be this. This is what, the, this is what church people are supposed to be, church folk. And we're supposed to be this. This is for us as family members. And, you can, and we're supposed to hold each other accountable. So since you've received, received encouragement in Christ. So if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you've been given courage. God has put courage in you. So since you've received the agape love of God, the unconditional comfort of God's love, so since you've received his spirit, if you've said yes to him and you believed in his resurrection, he put his spirit in you, giving you the power. Since you've received that spirit and so since, he says you've received God's affectionate sympathy. Now again, we may not always feel those things, but those are the truths. So since you've got that, then he says you've got to do some things. You don't get a choice. You've got to do some things. And what are the things we're supposed to do? Paul says complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So Paul's like saying this. He's saying, look, complete my joy. In other words, joy is this 360 degree circle. It's like complete my joy. God's joyful when we find life in him, when we find connection with one another. And Paul's like, complete my joy by doing these things and you'll have joy too. And what are the things he wants us to do? Four things. Be of one mind. Be of, be of one, one love, be of full accord, and be of the same mind. Again, he says one mind twice. Literally, you could translate it, have the mind of Christ, have the heart or love of Christ, have the spirit of Christ, and have the purpose of Christ. Let me break this down real quick. When he says have the mind of Christ, he doesn't say agree on everything. We don't all have to love the same teams. We don't all have to love the same politics. But we have the mind of Christ. We say, God, give me your mind. Let me think as you think. Second, let me have your heart and your love. Let me see others the way you see others. Let me have the compassion, the heart of God, full of cord. We, we, if, if, if Suzanne and I both, we both are in Christ and have the spirit in us, then we're of one accord. Our spirits agree. We may not agree on politics. We may not agree on teams. We may not agree on mask or no mask, but here's what we can agree on. The Spirit is in me. The Spirit is in you. We agree together. We share the Spirit, and then we share the same purpose. And what is our purpose? To bring the kingdom, to bring God's love and grace, to invite others into a relationship with Jesus. This is a beautiful picture. Again, this is not about creating cookie-cutter Christians. If anyone hears this, like, oh, so I'm supposed to agree? With no, we're going to disagree. We're going to have things we disagree with. This is, this is not about uniformity. Here's the deal. Hear me. Unity without diversity is uniformity. We do not want uniformity. Uniformity is blah, bland. Unity is all different backgrounds, all different colors, all different 
thoughts out there united in the thoughts and mind and heart that matter. The mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the purpose of Christ. So again, I can disagree with you on politics. You can disagree with me on whatever theological views. I can be Arminian or I can be Calvinist or I can be, we can disagree on these secondary tertiary issues, but we are united in the macro issues. My wife and I have been married 24 years. We, honest to goodness, we have never fought over macro issues, but we fight all the time over micro issues, right? Can I get an amen in there, right? Like, 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 we have not ever fought over the resurrection of Jesus. We've not ever fought over our purpose to be and bring the kingdom. We've not ever fought about the fact that we're supposed to be people of generosity. to bring. We've never fought about the fact that we want to invite our children into a deep relationship with Christ. We want to reflect the kingdom to our world. We've never fought about that. How we do that? Oh, my goodness. We got bumped yesterday. Use Greg and Val's language. We got bumped in the car yesterday. I had to show her she was wrong. You know, it's like the, uh, right? Like, we just got bumped. And that happens. We're the, that's micro issues. But, but we're standing together on the macro issue. We, we, we work through the bumps and the ma- micro issues standing on the foundation of the macro issues. That's what we're supposed to do as a church. We're not supposed to avoid conflict with each other. Healthy relationships step into the conflict. And so, so here's the deal. Next time you, you have someone come up to you and say, I want to know, what is your view on politics? Stop. Before we say another word. What's your view on the resurrection of Jesus? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah, he rose from the dead. Okay, what's your, resurre- what's your view on the Holy Spirit? He put his spirit in us. Okay, we're supposed to agree on the Holy Spirit. What's your view on bringing the kingdom? Uh, we agree. On- okay, now we can talk about what does it look like? You vote for Biden, you vote for Trump, I vote for Trump, Biden, you vote for Trump, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We'll talk about that. I, okay, I want to know. What's your view on six day literal creation? Do you believe in six day literal? Okay, what do we believe about the resurrection? Jesus rose from the dead? Okay, we agree on that. We agree on, put his spirit in this, we agree. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation about that. We can, we can now discuss that stuff in a healthy place because we're standing on the firm foundation of the one things that matter. And again, it's okay to disagree. It's just, we do so from the place of saying, God has invited us to more with one another, to be unified in the things that matter. I, I had, you can imagine, after I gave this talk in Loveland, uh, last week, I had six calls from six different people, and, and the calls all went something like this, and well-meaning, I love you, Matt, I love you, I love you, I love you. They're, I just want to know, is, are you saying we don't take a stance on these different sin issues? I want to know. Now, wh- how did you hear that? I, 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 one, one person, I wanna, so are you saying that we don't think homosexuality is a sin? I'm like, I don't know where, I never mentioned that in my talk. That was nowhere in the talk. What, why are we going there? What did I say? Let's stand on the resurrection of Jesus. Are we filled with the Spirit? Now we can have a conversation about this other issue. And personally, I hope you're not offended. I, I believe homosexuality is a sin. But we love, we're to, the higher way is to love, the, love whoever, wherever, whatever, whenever, however, whatever sin, we're all sinful and broken in need. Can I get an amen on that? Right? Our higher calling is to bring the love and grace of Jesus to a world that so desperately needs it. And then Paul gives us a couple things to do to help us be of the same mind, same spirit, same love, and same purpose. And these are simple things. They're not complicated, but they're really hard. Look at verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So let's just pause on that word, nothing. Like circle that. If you've got your Bibles, you ought to just highlight that word, nothing. It doesn't say most things, do most things, do some things, do a few things. Nothing from selfish ambition. Dang. Anyone else have a black eye? All right, anyone just like, oh my goodness. Like half of what I do is done out of selfish ambition, vain conceit. Or not, not me. I know you guys struggle with that. I mean, there's constant. Like we're always posturing to get our name out there. We're always posturing to make sure, right? Like every time you see a photo of yourself, who do you look at first when, when a group shot? Me? How do I look? You scroll. Oh, I look good. It's a great picture. I look bad. Take another one. Right? We all do it. And 
We're, we're, we go into every job situation. Every, like, how am I going to get ahead? We have a, a reward mentality. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a me economics mentality versus a kingdom economics mentality. How does the kingdom win? And Paul, Paul's saying, if you really want to walk in uni- unity, walk into every situation saying, God, help me to set aside my personal ambition. Now, please do not hear me say, it's wrong to be competitive and wrong to be what good at something. I have three daughters that all play competitive soccer, two in college. My middle daughters called me the other day and said, Dad, I may not start, and that ticks me off. And I said, good, go win the position. Go get it. But, but do not put down your teammates. Lift your teammates up. Pour into them. Call it life in them. Be a good teammate and bloom where you're planted. But go fight for the position, right? Go. Well, you, you, should, you, should, you should, it's okay to want that promotion at work. Work hard for it. But your identity is not found in it. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Look to lift others up. And he, and he counters it, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Now, this is interesting. He doesn't say, he doesn't say that you're worthless. He doesn't say you're insignificant. It's an interesting verbiage that Paul uses here. In humility, count others significant than yourselves. It's rooted in an understanding to Christ followers, that we know our identity is found in Christ. We know where our significance is found. If I'm standing in my significance in Christ, I stand solid in who I am in Christ, then I can say, Marianne, I want you to know you're significant. You're really significant. I'm not worried about lifting up my significance because I know where my significance is found. Therefore, you're significant. I lift you up. Humility isn't about self-flagellating. It isn't about beating ourselves up. I love what C.S. Lewis about, says about humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourselves. It's thinking about yourself less. You're so, we're so confident in who we are in Christ. I'm like, I don't need to think about myself. I can walk into the room, and instead of thinking, I hope Greg thinks I'm funny. I'm going to tell a story so that Val will laugh. I'm like, no, instead I say, what, how, can I, how can I lift Patrick up? How can I count Patrick as significant and say, you matter. Aaron, you matter. I'm going to elevate you to a place of power and status. And then he goes on to say, and not look only to your own interests. Now, isn't it interesting? He doesn't say, don't look to your interests. He says, look not only to your interests. So, right, it's, it's, it's good to be healthy. It's good to get good sleep. It's good to take care of yourself and rest. It's good to, to do Sabbath, to care for your heart. But he's saying, look not only to your interests, but, but look to the interests of this. Like, just don't think about you, but think, how can I help John? How can I help Zach be all that they're meant to be? When we do this, then we create trust and unity in the family. And then when we come to a division or come to a disagreement, we don't divide because there's trust and there's connection rooted in relationship. Uh, so again, anytime you have a friend that is experiencing anger or fear over the current circumstances we're in, Instead of looking at them and saying, don't be angry, don't be afraid, really helpful, right? Isn't it really helpful when your spouse or good friend says, you need to chill. Thank you, I feel so loved and heard. But instead, they, come, they, they seem angry. I, I'm, I really want to be interested in you. I want to be interested in you. Tell me what the fear, t- tell me what's going on. Why are you angry? Tell me what the fear is about. Let's unpack that. Let's process that together. And, and let's understand one another. So I, I love how Eugene Peterson translates this little package of verses. He says, don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. I love that. When we have the the mind, the heart, the spirit and purpose of Christ, we will think about others. Why? Because Jesus is always thinking about you. Everything he does has you in mind. He's constantly thinking about me, constantly thinking about you. And he says, if you have my heart in mind, then you'll always be thinking of others. You're so secure in your relationship with me. You're so secure in my love for you that you now just want to give that away. And now I'm, I'm, I'm now no longer trying to make sure my rights are met. And now I find myself saying, I want to elevate others' rights. I want to give my life away. That's why we're here after all, right? It says four things I've written down that I want to be. Be selfless, be humble, be interested. These bring unity. Be be, be selfless, be humble, 
be interested. And the last one, which just trumps it all, and be like Jesus, be like Christ. Paul just, he comes and just brings it all in and just says, have the mind among your, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I don't know, but this is one of the first verses I ever memorized. And I remember thinking how it's translated in most translations, your attitude should be the same as Christ. I don't know about you, that seems impossible, doesn't it? But the truer translations is how the ESV translates it. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. When you're in Christ and Christ is in you, the Holy Spirit is in you, he's already given that to you. You have this mind. You have this heart. It's now the process of fleshing it out. It's saying, God, help it come out of me. That's why Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Lean in constantly. Work it out of me. This is, this is who you are. This is what you have. It's attainable because Christ is in you and you're in Christ. This should be our prayer. God, help me to have your mind, your heart, your spirit so that I will live and walk in unity. And then he goes on to describe in some of those beautiful words in scripture what Jesus did for us. He's not asking us to do something he's not done himself. Let me read this. And while I do this, I want to invite Marianne St. John up here. Here's what he writes. And if the band wants to come up too, you can come on up. Think of yourselves. Let's do this. Would you just do me a favor? Just close your eyes as you hear this. Let's just wash over you. Just, just close your eyes and maybe just take a deep breath and just hear this, receive this. Just, and think, this is what I want to be. This is God. This is who you've made me to be. Just here's what he says. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call it in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. This is what Jesus has done for us, and this is what he's called us to do because we've received him. So with this in mind, and I believe we live like this, man, we'll have unity, and we'll have power, and I believe people will flock to the church of Jesus because they'll say, I want to be with that. So with this in mind, last, again, last week, it was maybe two weeks ago, Tuesday or Wednesday, I was preparing for this, and I called Marianne, Maria St. John is a faithful, longtime North Starian friend. I've known her for in, in my vineyard days. And she's what we would call a prophetic person, very prophetic, listens to the Lord. And I said, Do you got a you feel like the Lord's telling you anything? And she she texts back, Oh my gosh, yes. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you gotta share this. So I would like her to share this word, and then we'll wrap up. All right, go ahead. Good morning, North Star. Um, when Matt called me, uh, I did text him just a, a little bit, and then I said, I'll email you the rest. And um, when I heard his message, it was kind of like, it was almost like we sat down and did it together. Mm. So it, it's just amazing how God works. So what I texted him was, the Big C Church is us. We are in community together. We are to commune in unity so in putting that piece together with some other things that, um, that God had been speaking to me about, Matt said, yeah, come, come and share. So <clears throat> when I talk about um, that God had been speaking to me, we are all individuals. God made us all. So we all can hear very differently from the Lord. For me, it's something that just resonates again and again. It just keeps coming up. So I know the Lord's trying to get my attention. So very simply, the world, other Christians, non-Christians, our relatives, <clears throat> our acquaintances, our neighbors, people we don't know, really they're all looking at us as Christians because that's what 
we're supposed to be the example. I, I know I've heard, um, well, yeah, they're supposed to be a Christian. I've probably even thought it hmm. when I look at something someone else has done. So let's just be strong for Jesus. When we respond in love, being non judgmental, speaking in unity, not division, we encourage. Let us resist the tactics of the devil to use us to steal, kill, and destroy, and rise up in unity, encouraging the body. Mm. As in John 10, 10, 10, where Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I feel, I really feel that the Lord wants us to speak life into those around us. So what is your mindset? Are you actively looking for an opportunity to speak into others' lives? To unite the body? What are you doing to stretch your spiritual muscles? Stretch, ooh, it feels good, but no, it usually hurts. Stretching muscles, that makes me think I'm doing something that's not comfortable. And, and that's really what the challenge is. Take the first steps and be strong for Jesus. It can be saying hi to someone, to a stranger. Sometimes that's really uncomfortable. It could be calling somebody you know. It could be praying for somebody. It could be registering for Sockham. But stretch. Make space for God because he will fill it. So my encouragement to you, the body, would be this. Be hungry or get hungry mm. and stay unified in the relentless pursuit of Jesus. Mm. That's a good word. Stay hungry or get hungry. <clears throat> would you close your eyes? Let me join. Can we have a little background music so I can sound good at this part? I think I'm, I'm going to ask Marianne to pray for you guys in a minute. And, and we're going to take communion. And we get to take communion to come grab one of these things and, and, and break bread and the juice to represent what Jesus did for us, laying his body down the cross, pouring out his blood to set us free from our sin. And he rose again to give us life, to remind us what he did for us, and therefore call us to more. Remind us how he saved us so that we're part of the process to be unified in the body of Christ and invite others into this family. He did for us what we're allowed and what we're invited to invite others into. So let's not forget that. So as you worship this last song, as you come take communion, come get prayer, invite prayer teams up, just, or, or if you just want to pray with your families, pray for unity in your families, pray for against this stuff, I'm, just invite you to stand now. And Marianne's going to just pray an anointing, a blessing over us. And please don't leave without getting prayer. Just come get prayer. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you just fill the body, fill the hearts mm. with the fire of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that we recognize that we walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, the same authority that he had when he was here on earth. pray, Lord, that you create the opportunities and open the doors to, for us to seek out others to encourage and to build up one another. And Father God, I pray that your, that your unity permeates, that it just overwhelms and overflows from us. Just unify our thoughts with the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, come Holy Spirit.
sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath goodness of God all my life yeah. and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will see the goodness of God. Oh, your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness this is running after it's running after me your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running Thank you that when you draw us in, you not only draw our hearts in closer to you, but you draw us together as one body and unity. So Lord, as we go from this place, let us maintain that oneness, maintain that unity as we go out and represent not only ourselves, but as we represent the name of Christ. So God, be with us, lead us, and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, have a great week. We'll see you next week. Feel free to hang around, but otherwise we'll see you then.